guys. Good to see you. Um, thanks a lot, Dom, for, for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, it's a real exciting conference for me because uh, um, actually having a bunch of people who are into ketogenic dieting and not 99% of the crowd against it is actually a pretty unique experience. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> all right, so obviously it's a real interesting topic. What got me into it? When I was actually an undergraduate, um, and uh, Sean Wells, my good friend, uh, actually kind of introduced me into, to it. I was actually low fat, very low fat diet, um, and you know, kind of typical bodybuilding diet, and he kind of introduced me to the topic. And then when I, was, uh, when I was in grad school, I met Dom probably like in 2008 at Experimental Biology Conference. And Dom's just like eating sardines the whole time, <laughs> pre, pre Quest era. <laughs> right, we didn't have Quest bars. And, uh, you know, I was like, oh, what's going on? And he came to the Strength and Conditioning Conference, and, uh, and Dr. Jeff Volick was up there talking about ketogenic dieting and performance. And um, basically, uh, you know, he had a lot of really cool data, but he indicated uh, that we need a lot more work in resistance training literature. And, and, and Ryan and I looked at each other and said, man, we got a lot of work to do. And so, um, also, if you look at Dom, he basically has an age since I met him. <laughs> and so I was like, well, this is really, really interesting, right? We know that you know, ketones are histone de inhibitors, and you know, it's, it's really interesting to us. So um, <clears throat> the other thing is that it's important to understand that we have individual differences. <clears throat> this we're looking at here. You're looking at basically we have number to treat and number to harm. Anytime you give a treatment to an individual, you know that basically they can respond or not respond. So if they don't respond or get worse, that'd be like harm. If they respond well, that would be treat. So if you look here, this is a low carb. These are individuals who lost fat on a low carb diet, people who didn't get any benefit, and maybe some people who maybe gained a little weight. But if you look here at the low fat, it's kind of one third, one third, one third. So less people benefited from the low fat diet than the low carb. I thought that was interesting. Now, if you look here, what's occurring? People are different. That's the point. We need more tools in the toolbox. And so if you look here, this is a group where individuals, they split them into insulin resistant and insulin sensitive, and they put them on a low fat diet. The insulin sensitive people lost fat. The insulin resistant people did not. But on the low carb group, both the insulin resistant and sensitive people both lost fat, which means that you're able to respond possibly at a higher rate to low carbohydrate diets, more ketogenic type diets. So this was very interesting to us. Um, this is some recent data that, that we collected uh, on, in rats that show, kind of go against the paradigm that a calorie is a calorie, you know, as far as a calories in versus calories out scenario. People make it that simple, but it's not. So what you have here is we have three groups. We have a ketogenic dieting group. We have a Western dieting group, which is like McDonald's. And then you have a standard chow, <laughs> which is low fat, low fat group. Now they could eat whatever they wanted, right? So the, he, this is the low fat, um, higher protein group. They ate less calories than the McDonald's diet and the keto diet. So the, the keto diet ate as many calories as the McDonald's and the low fat ate the least. <clears throat> now, Total protein consumed was the same though for the keto and the, and the low fat diet. Uh, protein was a little bit less than the McDonald's diet. But look at this. Look at fat here, omental fat. You look at this. This is the uh, McDonald's diet. That's the keto diet. And then that right there is the low fat diet. So they ate less calories, same amount of protein, less calories, but had more fat here than the keto group. So what that tells us is that it's not as simple as like a calorie in, calorie versus out, right? And so this is really interesting to us as well. What application could this have to sport? This here to, is very powerful to me. When I saw this, it really drove me to want to do more research in this or us. This is basically looking at the Western diet, typical diet in our society on the rat. You can see fat all around the organs. And that's the ketogenic dieting group, same calories. And it looks like an anatomy chart, right? And so that, that blew us away. Um, 
Interestingly enough, if you look at feed efficiency, like how much body weight they're gaining per calorie, this, this is basically, we have an exercise group we had here. So this is an exercise group. This is a, a carb group. So they're on carbs and they're exercising. And this is the amount of weight they're gaining uh, per calorie. This is when you add exercise plus exogenous ketones. They're gaining less weight per calorie. This is exercise on a ketogenic diet, less weight per calorie. And then exercise plus exogenous ketones, body weight, um, and uh, amount of body weight they gain per calorie. It just says that something interesting is going on here. And one thing that we found, who's heard of like bat, like brown adipose tissue, right? This hot, a lot of mitochondria that the, uh, the, the animals that were supplemented with the ketones had more brown adipose tissue. And this is with ketone salts. So that was interesting to us. So moving into the performance realm, kind of extending on what Jeff talked about, we're gonna talk more about the resistance training side of things. And so basically, we're gonna talk about resistance training uh, on more maintenance calories. And this is some work we collaborated on with Dom and Jeff that's in review. Um, we'll talk about cyclic ketogenic dieting. Who's heard of cyclic ketogenic dieting, okay? Uh, protein type in ketosis, uh, um, t and then training to speed up fat ad adaptation and conclusions. <clears throat> All right, <laughs> so <laughs> you guys know how this is, right? So basically, uh, you know, most of you think, oh, low carbs, there's no way that you can gain muscle on low carbs, right? This is kind of um, the, I guess, you know, Seafree talked about dogma, but, you know, and as far as like resistance training, this is also a dogma that we face that you can't gain muscle, I mean, on, on a low carb diet. I mean, I could see you doing it with long endurance. That might be beneficial to slow burning fuel, but can you gain muscle resistance training? And can you gain strength, right? So we took 30 subjects, half of them were keto, half of them were carb, control for protein intake and calories. Um, before we trained them, we gave them a two week keto adaptation period. If you just throw them in, of course you know during the first two weeks they're not gonna feel too good. You can see that here, so uh, basically, our lab's really good at getting subjects' ketone levels up high. We've spent a lot of time with each of them. And you see after two weeks that basically their ketone levels went up. They were up at least above 0.5 millimolars. That's the ketogenic group. <clears throat> That's when they start training. So this is looking at basically lean body mass gains overall. And you see the dark is the keto and the lighter gray is the carb. And they both were able to gain lean mass to the same extent, right? So you can gain lean mass on a ketogenic diet. And I think that's the point. You know, your body can adapt. And what about strength levels? Same thing, you have the keto and the high carb. Bench press strength, both went up the same. Squat strength, both went up the same, right? So you can gain strength you can gain lean mass um, on these diets. And I think that's, that's important to sort of understand your body can adapt, right? But, but without carbs, again, how can you do this? <laughs> you know, how can you simulate protein synthesis? So this is a, I'm gonna show you a paper that we just got published, uh, I, think, uh, <laughs> I think it was what, last month. Um, and uh, so this was rodent data. So we looked more molecular level, what's actually happening. Can you simulate protein synthesis? Um, so there's two models that we use. One is like an electrical stimulation model. So you kind of take the, the, you just electrically simulate the leg and simulate a resistance training model. And we looked at acute protein synthesis, right? Um, and if you look at protein synthesis, this is basically the high carb and the keto group, right? And they're increasing protein synthesis to the same extent on this acute bout uh, of stimulated resist simulated resistance training. So that's cool. You can simulate protein synthesis there. Um, if you look at um, uh, indicators of ribosomal biogenesis, which is obviously going to be important for like uh, you know long-term protein synthesis, they're both going up the same. This is a carb diet, and this is a keto diet. So you can adapt still even with on a low on a very low carbohydrate ketogenic diet, and we think this is exciting. Um, Okay, and then this is protein breakdown. When you lift weights, protein breakdown is going to go up. Okay, and so they both went up the same. 
and that's the point. So you're not, uh, it's not increasing protein breakdown, it's not impairing protein synthesis, and you can gain muscle in this state as well. So that is, that was really unique to us. <clears throat> okay, we wanted, you know, a lot of times when you do like a human model, people, even though you show ketone uh, data, like uh, ketones, they'll go, well, it's a human model, it's not super controlled, we need a more controlled model. So here's a rat model with resistance training. So I've done like all sorts of resistance training models of rats, um, but this is one Mike Roberts um, really likes that he set up. And so basically the animal goes in here, it's a resistance training, it has resistance in the wheel itself. And basically what you look at, they get used to running in the wheel, and then basically after several days, you just ramp up the resistance slowly, right? And so, but they'll keep running, and they actually get like hypertrophy uh, in their legs, you know, and in, in, their, in their calves. So if you look, if you look here, um, this is looking at running distance, was the same. So this is, we had a Western diet, McDonald's diet, a ketogenic diet, and again, a low fat, higher protein diet. They were able to do the same uh, sort of training volume. In fact, it's, you know, it's, that's the keto group right there. Uh, so their training volume was the same. Um, and if you look at muscle mass changes, all groups went up the same, right? So basically, um, they're, they're able to gain, again, in both human models and rat models that are very controlled, they're gaining muscle to the same extent. So I think this is exciting stuff because it shows you can adapt in a ketogenic state. Okay? Now, Jeff showed this, Jeff's data on glycogen was really fascinating to us. And this, he, he had athletes who were, you know, several, several months past a year. And these, these rats, over six weeks' time, there was no significant difference between the carb group and the uh, keto group as far as muscle glycogen levels. So that was, that's really interesting to us. And why is that? Uh, we're not sure. Jeff has, has some really cool molecular data and stuff. Um, one of the things that could be happening, we know glycerol, like Jeff pointed out. It could also be, you know, possibly um, some gluconeogenesis as well. Again, this is Jeff's data, which you saw, with uh, the ability to recover glycogen. But one thing could be also, um, again, like amino acid, basically like conversion of amino acids to uh, glycogen. So if you look at the amino acid profile, alanine basically uh, has a high conversion rate over eventually to glucose, right? So if you look here, this is the keto, this is the carb group and this is the ketogenic group. Alanine's much lower in the ketogenic group suggesting that this very glucogenic like uh, amino acid is being turned over to you know glucose much faster and glycogen much faster. But then what about the BCAAs? We think of those like highly anabolic, important for muscle hypertrophy. They're the same. So there, there's no significant difference between the, the carb group and the keto group. So what is this suggesting that basically the amino acids, which can be converted over to uh, glycogen very well or glucose very well, are being converted faster? but the ones that we think about are important for anabolism are being spared. Um, and so that's kind of interesting to us. And it's also interesting we looked at what happens if you give whey protein after, um, after you are on a ketogenic diet. What happens to branched chain amino acids? There's data that I, I remember seeing when Finney presented essentially where there's evidence that possibly a ketogenic diet might spare things like uh, leucine oxidation, right? So if you look here, this is a carb diet, and what we see is when, this is whey protein. So here, again, this is looking at uh, how high uh, leucine raises in the blood. That's when you're on a carb diet and you have whey protein, and that's overall BCAs. Look how much higher it raises in the blood when you're in the ketogenic diet, right? Now, I don't know why that's the case. There's a lot of reasons why that could be. But one thing is maybe BCAs are being spared. But we obviously need a lot more research to make that conclusion. But the point is BCAs are going up higher in the blood when you're in a ketogenic state than a carb state. So it, this is interesting to us. Because we know BCAs are important for muscle anabolism. Um, okay, now, cyclic. This is actually something really interesting. 
Um, and again, Dom helped us a lot with um, you know prepping this experiment and, and things of that nature. So cyclic, if you look at like the original books, I think especially was it Dan Duchesne was like the original guy to propose it. Basically, the thought is this: your glycogen is going to be real low, so you need to carb up. Now we know again from Jeff stated that's not actually the case, but that's the theory behind it. You're going to be glycogen depleted, and so you need to carb up on the weekends. Um, and then basically just go back to keto on the weekdays. So what you can see is you have essentially on the weekdays, a ketogenic diet on the weekends, you go high carb, okay? So what we did was a protocol where we actually did this and we restricted individuals with calories or in a calorie deficit. Um, and we were doing a lot of interval training with them. So they were doing a lot of interval training and they're in a calorie deficit and they were training overall like five days a week. <clears throat> okay, so here's what I want you to know. So here, this is the traditional ketogenic diet. These are blood ketones, okay? What you're seeing here is the cyclic group. These individuals, basically this is them after Sunday. That's their blood ketones on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they weren't really getting back into ketosis until Thursday and Friday. So how do you think they're feeling right here? Right? They're really not even getting back in till like maybe Thursday, maybe Friday. Um, and who knows what their ability to utilize ketones are. And that's something we're gonna talk about at the end of this, okay? So, but they both lost the same mass, okay? Total body mass. But what does that mean? You have to kind of look at the composition of that mass. If you look here, the ketogenic group lost a lot of body fat, and the cyclic group didn't. But they lost the same mass, so what do you think happened? They lost a lot of muscle. And this kind of goes to the idea that it is possible, and again, we need a lot more research on this, it is possible that ketones are muscle sparing. Think about this, if you're only eating 30 grams of carbs a day and your ketones aren't high, and you're not fat adapted, but you're carb adapted because you're carving up on the weekends, where are you gonna pull those carbohydrates from? It, protein. So the point is, that's the, that's the point. It's pro, it may not be in a dieting situation ideal. Now we, did not, we have some rat data where you're more at maintenance calories and we don't see the muscle loss, but at least in a deficit, we do. And so that's alarming to us. Um, and it shows maybe keto adaptation is very important for the whole fat loss paradigm to occur. This is strength. This is the keto group. And this is a cyclic group. Went, was tending to go down, right? This is strength endurance. The keto group goes up and the cyclic group's going down. They're not feeling very good on this, on, on this diet. They're not adapting very well. You're not allowing them to adapt. Okay. Now, one of the things I do want to point out, there are different methods that we need to really try. Okay. And we, this, that was an extreme protocol, but a lot of the books are extreme. So one of the things our lab, and a lot, I encourage a lot of you guys, researchers in the room is, we have to look at more is what about target it? You know, people talk about target it. Um, I know like um, I was talking with Ron Penna the other day about that and he might put, throw in a little bit, maybe like uh, 20, 25 grams pre-exercise of carbs. Maybe you can get a cognitive effect. We know like um, that like carbohydrate mouth rinse gives you a cognitive effect. Maybe there's some other benefits that you can get, but we don't know. Or maybe, I know some people will have a cheat meal on Saturday. Um, and, uh, but the point is you want to minimize that effect and probably two days might be extreme. So quickly is, how quickly can you adapt? This is something that we've been looking into. And, um, so this is something that um, Ryan Lowry and Chris Irvin have been looking at in our lab is basically, like you hear Jeff talk about and, and Dom talk about a well-formulated ketogenic diet. There's ketogenic diets, there's well-formulated ketogenic diets. And uh, we want to know what that, what that actually is. Um, the other thing is, is how does a diet interact with exercise? You know, several people will ask us, when we actually start a ketogenic diet, should I back off on my training? Should I back off during the adaptation phase? Well, Chris and Ryan were going, well, wait a second here. Uh, they go, 
maybe you should deplete faster, it'll force you to adapt faster. So what they did was they looked at individuals, about 21 individuals, and they had them essentially um, do interval training versus not interval training. Now both groups were resistance training, but the intervals are very brutal, right? So this is like, um, you guys, a lot of you guys have seen the intervals, but like this is, this is like Ben Pakulski in our lab when he was prepping for the Arnold Classic. But anyway, these are the Wingate intervals. Yeah, they're, these, this is the hard, anyways, these are the hardest intervals you possibly could do, ever. Like when we test the Tampa Lightning on it, they hate us. <laughs> so basically, I think one 30 second wing gait can deplete like muscle glycogen in the uh, part of the quads by something like 26%. Uh, so it's very, it's very brutal. So anyway, they did this for a week's time and just looked at what happened. Now this is a change in grams of fat oxidized with their traditional training plus keto, and if they did uh, traditional training plus interval, by the end of the week, their resting fat metabolism was a little bit higher. Um, and then if you look at blood ketones, this Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, it was a, looked a little bit higher for the traditional plus interval group uh, than the traditional keto group. So the indication, the indication is we think that possibly, uh, at least what these guys are suggesting, is that possibly just get it over with. Like drive yourself into keto adaptation possibly. That's one possible outcome. So we're looking more into this anyway, right? Um, okay, now this is the last thing I wanna talk about because I know I have to end. <laughs> uh, you know what, here's the thing, and I think this is really interesting. We all look, think about this for a second, like, uh, first you start with urine strips, like when you first start doing ketogenic dieting, what happens? It goes away, right? But everyone looks at, they'll look at blood, they'll look at blood and like, oh my God, I'm only like 0.3 today, right? You know, I must, let me, let me put my protein down. This must not be good, right? Everyone just looks at blood ketones. And here's my question, or you have, and then you're standing next to someone and they have a five, right? And you're going like, man, he's doing better than I am. Maybe I just, I'm, I just don't do well on the ketogenic diet. Think about this for a second, and this is purely speculative, so I'm not saying anything. I just think it's interesting and I bring up this question. If you have someone who has a resting blood glucose of like 300, they don't go, oh yeah, this is awesome, right? My question is, when blood ketones are gonna be a factor of ketone clearance, ketone utilization, and production. And we have to think about it from that perspective. So this is just some interesting data from our last study um, and uh, that Ryan pointed out to me. Uh, but you look at this, you have like 22-year-old, 23-year-old. So this during the last experiment. We were playing around with a ketone tolerance test, okay? So it's basically like glucose tolerance test, but we gave uh, ketones. Now what you're seeing here basically is this subject here started out, okay, at about 0.7 millimolars. They're certainly in ketosis by blood levels, but this person was starting at almost, uh, you know, very high, like near five, okay? Now you would go, this person must be better keto adapt adapted than this person by looking at their blood. So what we looked at was we gave the ketones after, right? And look at this. This person's barely going up. They're barely going up. This person keeps going up and up and up and up. It's not, not going up. We had to end the test at 180 because their blood glucose was going so low. But they felt fine, that was kind of interesting. But their blood glucose had got down to like 50. My point is, this person, are they so high because they're <laughs> keto adapted or because they're not using the ketones? So it's going up in their blood and this person's staying the same. My point is that, I'm just thinking in my mind, what does it mean to be in ketosis? If your ketones aren't super high, does it mean that you're really good at using them? You know? Um, and so these are things I would like to explore more and fundamentally understand what is happening with ketones. Where are they going? How are they being utilized? What is keto adaptation? So just throwing it out there. 
Um, and I think that should be uh, around the end. Just in conclusion, um, <clears throat> oh, I'm not, I don't have time for this one, but um, it seemed this is data basically just it's kind of indicating that the interval training kind of improved the ketone tolerance test a little bit. So anyway, basically the, the take home message is um, ketogenic dieting might provide a unique metabolic state. We've seen some inter interesting things where it's not just all about calories. There are some interesting, unique metabolic properties um, to this diet. Secondly, when you resistance train in a very low carbohydrate state, you can make adaptations. You can gain lean mass. You can increase protein synthesis. Protein breakdown does not go up. Um, and overall, um, you, can, you can gain, again, gain muscle, you know? Um, volume is not impaired. Training volume is not impaired. We've seen that in human models and, um, and rodent models as well. Um, <clears throat> interval training from Chris and, and Ryan's data indicate that you might be able to speed keto adaptation. Um, and, and, and the other thing is that I just want to come up with a method that could be better for determining if you're keto adapted besides just endogenous blood ketones. See what I mean? So that's it, guys. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm interested in, in whether people think about like levels of, you know, like if, if I have a certain level of glucose in my bloodstream, uh, and I'm relying on transport of energy you know, through my blood to get to, to the muscles that are, that are doing the exercise, that would tell me something about what level of ketones or, or glucose or fat that I need in my bloodstream. Uh, and I contrast that with glycogen, where I don't need to transport it through my blood, right? But it, it seems like that's kind of a key thing to know about, and I'm just wondering if people think about it in those terms. That I know how fast blood is moving through my veins and arteries, uh, so I know how much I can deliver, and, and if I need to deliver a lot of calories, then I need a certain level of those nutrients in my bloodstream in order to, to carry out that effort, uh, and I need you know, the oxygen to go along with it. Yeah. I'm just wondering, if, so in terms of thinking about what those levels need to be and, and what's going to drive those levels, if, if, if anyone does it from that kind of energy balance point of view. Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. These metabolic physiology studies are pretty difficult to do, but I think you could... Yeah. 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 The mic's not working. That's the camera. This is for a long time. There you go. I'm going to pass this over to Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, certainly more work needs to be done on uh, ketone tracers. Oh, this one. Okay. Oh, okay. Here we go. All good. Um, but classically, what we know is when you're keto adapted, the most of the ketones are being taken up by the brain and, and, and spared for the brain, and the muscle actually uh, decreases its reliance on ketones. It gets the majority of its energy from fatty acids uh, in the keto adapted state and, and spares the beta hydroxybutyrate for you know, brain metabolism. Um, yeah, yeah. So there's a, um, you know, as you learned, I think, in the uh, first lecture of the conference, that there's a dose, um, basically a linear, linear increase. As the blood levels of ketones increase, you get a increased uptake in, in utilization in the brain. That's not the case in skeletal muscle. As concentration increases, you don't get a greater uptake in the skeletal muscles. So there's, there's different transporters, different uh, KMs and in, in, in utilization um, relationships with ketone concentration. But we do need to replicate a lot of that in the keto-adapted state. It, it's been many years. There's a few studies going back over 20 years that, that looked at some of this. So I wanted to ask uh, two or three kind of along the same line. As a triathlon coach, I do a lot of lactate testing for all my Ironman triathletes. And I wanted to ask you in the testing that you've done, has there been any um, attention given to what the hydration level is of the athlete as well as the, the electrolyte intake? Because I have found over the years with testing my people, I also test for blood sugar as well and not just lactate, which is another thing I wanted to ask about. But I found the same athlete that's been with me for a number of years, same diet, same routine, I get different results in my lactic threshold testing for them based upon the electrolyte content they have 
or the hydration content that they have or don't have. And I'm curious if you've played with that or know anything about that and how the blood sugar may play a role in some of that. Because I have some of my athletes that can consume food and because they can metabolize it lickety split because they're just better at that than some other people, I get a better result in all the lactate testing compared to others that don't metabolize as well and I get different results. So I'm curious if we're really talking about the same cellular level and uptake, does any of that change at all? Or have you noticed anything with hydration or electrolytes? I mean, all, all I'll say real quick, because uh, we haven't done a whole lot with, with those types of experiments, but in the keto adapted state, there's a naturesis of ketosis. You know, it's been described as the naturesis of fasting, but it's really related to carbohydrate restriction and ketosis. So there is an increased in, uh, requirement for sodium on a ketogenic diet. Um, and that hasn't been studied in great depth, but it's about one to two grams for most people. And if you don't understand that and, and, uh, and increase your sodium intake, it, there's a lot of problems with the contracted plasma volume, especially for athletes when you're already stressing your blood volume because there's you know, the increased uh, blood flow to, to the tissues. Uh, so that's really important. Um, but on hydration, you know, I would, Turn the mic over to maybe a Peter Defty that's done a lot of work with uh, athletes, um, you know, on the front lines, uh, and athletes, so. or anybody else that wants to take one. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, do you want to say anything about that? With the yeah, well, it's, you're making a real general statement about where they are in their their diets or how uh, physiologically adapted they are towards fat metabolism, but when they are, what we've seen with ultra runners, long course triathletes, is you better be hydrating, it's water plus a lot of sodium plus active magnesium. Agreed. And I was just curious whether you actually put an emphasis on what the hydration level and electrolytes are. I guess that was the drive of my question. I got derailed. The question was hydration, very important for accurate testing and the electrolytes, and do you check that? Do you look at that? I guess was my point. I, I think one of the things we do do in, in research, and Finney's been doing this for a long time because Jeff pointed out, you, we do pay attention to hydration. And so all the way back to Finney's work in the 80s, you know, giving certain minerals that are important for that, that might be, you know, like sodium, is gonna be very, very critical, again, when you go on a ketogenic diet. So, um, I think that's, that's the main thing. Yes, we do pay attention to it, and yes, a well-formulated ketogenic diet, you know, should pay attention to that as well, you know, as for, particularly in, as it concerns sodium. Uh, I was gonna say something real quick. Uh, I was, when I started the ketogenic diet, I, the main side effect I had was cramps. And I would wake up in the middle of the night, four o'clock every morning by the clock, and I'd have these calf cramps. And, uh, and I got a blood magnesium, and it was a little below the threshold. For, it was low. And I supplemented uh, originally with slow mag, I think, from just like CVS, and then I had magnesium gly glycinate. Um, and my magnesium is in mid to upper range of normal, and I never get cramps anymore. Magnesium's involved in dozens, if not hundreds, of different biochemical reactions in, in metabolism. So I think uh, people need to supplement with magnesium, maybe, if they're not getting it in their diet. And I actually, I have a lot of magnesium-rich foods in my diet. But the one electrolyte that was off in me and other blood work that I've seen was, was magnesium. Um, question for you on uh, you alluded to it in your presentation but I know there's some uh, discussion around this theoretically but leucine threshold leucine sensitivity there's different terms for it that maybe um, that level is potentially lower in the state can you comment on okay uh, so basically great question so Sean's question is uh, when you talk about like we think there's a threshold to like turn on protein synthesis with pl with leucine, and we think it's roughly a doubling of plasma leucine levels. This is just 
speculative, right? We're, I'm just speculating here. But if you look at like the data, when you give uh, BCAAs or whey, when you're keto adapted, BCAAs go up higher in the blood. So the question is, people are always very scared about having, uh, you know, for bodybuilders, they might have like 2.5 grams of, or three grams of protein, whatever, per kilogram of body weight. And with ketogenic dieting, it might be, like in our study, it was like 1.7, right? And bodybuilders will think that's very, very low. But bottom line is it's conceivable that maybe the threshold for leucine, hitting that threshold to turn on protein synthesis could lower if you look at the blood data. That research has to be done, though. So I'm purely speculating, but it would be really cool if someone's going to do research on this is look at protein synthesis, but look at a dose response of leucine and when protein synthesis is turned on. Um, I think it'd be a real cool experiment. All right, the, point, well, the, the biggest takeaway I took from uh, your talk today was that uh, the ketogenic uh, performance exerciser is getting the same, if not uh, elevated, adaptation to exercise as the regular high carb traditional, but without the health risk associated with the higher carb diet or sugar glucose. My question though is for the aging athlete, are we seeing improvement or uh, uh, any kind of markers that shows that sarcopenia and osteoporosis and those kind of issues are increasing as well? Because um, you know, I don't know if they're getting the same calcium and you know that kind of stuff too. So are we seeing the aging athletes? Because most of the studies were on the younger athletes. Are they going to see the same results going forward for those preventive issues? Um, are they going to you know prevent that natural aging, the weakness of the bones and the muscles, and the loss of muscle? Okay, great question. So um, one, I just I want to point something out. Like we, it's real important to understand that in our studies, we our studies were eight to ten weeks long. People who we keto adapted for two weeks and they trained for eight weeks resistance training, we saw getting the same gains in muscles, people who were carb adapted. Now they had been eating carbs their entire life. What we really need to, to, to see is like basically what Jeff did with endurance athletes, people who have been on average 15 months, you know, people who have been years on the diet and how they respond to resistance training. That's gonna be interesting to see you know, um, on how they respond. So I'm just saying there's a lot to do in, in this area. It's to be very cool. Um, I think Jeff's done more and like, he, he has a real cool resistance training study. Maybe you could speak to that, um, you know, probably in a little bit uh, older population, you know, the uh, middle-aged population. Um, do you want to speak to that? Well, I think you bring up a good point with the um, bone density and osteoporosis, we don't really have any good long-term data on the ketogenic diet. Uh, we don't see any evidence that that'll be a problem metabolically or short-term DEXA scans. We have bone density, but they're short-term. You know, you really have to f track people for a year or longer to see changes in bone density. So uh, calcium can be low on a ketogenic diet. It depends if you're eating cheese or not. If you're avoiding that, it's quite likely your calcium may not be high unless you're making broth um, yourself and getting the calcium to leach out of the bones. So, you know, the, it is one of those issues that's not particularly high on my priority list, but it's been pointed out and does need to be investigated by somebody long term. But yeah, we don't see any health concerns. In fact, just the opposite. I mean, uh, almost across the board, whatever health marker you look at, um, there seems to be a benefit to a ketogenic diet. So I don't see any red flags for sure. I don't even really see any yellow flags um, to be concerned about, assuming, of course, you're, you have the diet formulated appropriately. Dr. Boros. So uh, have you thought about 13 c mode uh, uh, ketone uh, tracing or hyperpolarized C13 MRI or uh, proton spectrum based on low deuterium uh, fat oxidation in T1 sequences, because these are all available methods. As I looked at his data, when you see so uh, much accumulation of ketone in the plasma, <coughs> it's probably because of molecular, uh, molecular crowding. So it's, it's really not a turnover that you can measure. For, you have to trace for these uh, substrates and products. Another problem is, uh, Non-tracer-based metabolomics or genomics using for biochemical interpretations is pretty much useless. So you have to trace. Uh, otherwise, this data may have, will, will not 
be as, as efficient in, in, as far as interpretations go for a good medical purpose. Yeah, thank you. Agreed. <laughs> Next year, hopefully, we'll have that at this conference. <laughs> So when you, you showed that the, uh, the cycling, the cycle, when you did the cycling diet, um, the simple, simple diet, that there was a decrease in, in, in mass, but some of it was um, muscle mass and it was adipose tissue. Have you guys seen anything with using exogenous ketone supplement, uh, supplementation to prevent that from happening? Uh, we, we haven't, but it'd be a super cool study. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, maybe my biochemistry is lacking a little bit, but there's a, uh, uh, a part of, uh, as far as you know, the cellular biology, uh, there are two sides that I have a hard time with, uh, reconciling. So ketogenic diets, fasting, low uh, calorie restrictions are known to extend aging. Uh, often, I think they just size the mTOR, sort of pathways. Uh, which trigger autophagy, you know, cell recycling. Uh, but I also see some literature that, you know, for muscle building and maintenance, the whole system needs to be switched the other direction. Uh, so at that level, I have a, a hard time, you know, putting it together because uh, it seems like uh, the diets have it just anti-aging effect, but they also have incredible, you know, muscle preservation effect and even muscle gain still uh, when the system is supposedly being turned off. Uh, so that's one question, I guess. There are different uh, hypotheses of aging. Uh, another one is telomere length. Uh, have any of you or do you know any work uh, measuring telomerase activity or uh, telomere lengths? I don't think so. I mean, there's a couple um, papers published last year, and one in C. elegans, and the other one in an advanced or accelerated model of aging. And it's the same model, uh, both showing a ketogenic diet uh, enhanced longevity. Uh, so there is some work in that area. It, yeah, beta hydroxybutyrate, when used in a nematode, a C. elegans model, extended life, I think, about 25%. And that was that work was done at University of South Florida uh, by Claire Edwards, and it mimicked the effect of calorie restriction. So independent of calorie restriction, it was published in OncoTarget and I think in another aging journal. Yeah, so so uh, it's pretty pretty compelling. What, what was interesting about that study in the C. elegans is that there was a burst of reactive oxygen species, I think, initially. And because switching over to a fuel source, a new, a different fuel source for the C. elegans and probably the human, uh, had, had a what you call hormetic effect. And that stress, you know, was kind of key to, to activating ultimately downstream signaling pathways that conferred the longevity effects. So, um, and we're looking at the molecular through different model systems, looking at the molecular pathways that you're interested in. We actually have IRB approval too for a lifelong study that we're starting with. Dr. Dom and Angela is gonna be involved as well, looking at a lifelong model of ketogenic dieting itself, ketone supplementation itself, and potentially even looking at the offspring of those uh, individual or the mice in that instance to look at we talk about gene tra gene, gene transcription and histone deacetylase activity what can go on down at the molecular level so we'll have that hopefully starting soon <laughs> yeah. I would be careful to obviously there's a lot of studies that show caloric restriction and extend life I mean that's pretty well known and rapamycin has shown it extend life I'd be careful though because I've shown direct comparisons. One paper recently that came out on BCAAs ex directly comparing those to, in a um, Nature Medicine paper, directly compare caloric restriction to BCAAs. And they found that one, they actually <coughs> looked at nematodes and mice. Um, and they found that one of the more important things in the aging process was BCAAs and the breakdown of BCAAs. 
Um, they also found that when inhibiting one of the molecules that breaks down the initial step of BCAs uh, was pretty critical in extending life. And they also found that one of the more important things to extend life when comparing rapamycin to this other inhibitor of BCA breakdown um, was that mTOR was actually critical to get that full effect because when you use rapamycin with this BCA breakdown inhibitor, they didn't see the extent of life in comparison. So it actually wasn't, I don't know if I'm being clear, but BCAs being present and actually stimulating the mTOR effect had a more robust effect when directly compared to something that inhibits the mTOR effect. So I'd be careful to assume that in inhibition of mTOR is that answer for longevity because uh, a lot of evidence, because there's a lot, there's a, a slew of papers now that BCAs actually extend life. Um, I wouldn't say much of the direct effect in comparison to caloric restriction, but in this paper they directly showed that caloric, uh, rapamycin with something that prevents the breakdown from BCAs extended life, and that was through the mTOR pathway. Um, so I, some, some of the answer your question potentially, and I think it's worth further investigation, is that BCAs may extend a... Uh, absolutely. Come, yeah, I'll talk to you afterwards about that. I would love to. Said, there are different hypotheses of aging, and I mean, yeah. right now because they're more very, very partial. Yeah. Uh, I have a hard time describing what is aging in the first place. Uh, I think that's a very hard question. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, the first was for uh, Dr. Bullock. Um, in your pastor study, what were the performance characteristics of your athletes in the high carb versus the low carb? So you had endurance trained athletes, but was any one group any faster than the other? What was their speed at uh, 62 or 65 percent VO2 max when you did your three hour run? Yeah, they um, they there was no difference in the in the speed. These were well matched on on perf their performance capabilities. So they most of them ran. Uh, boy, I have to ask Kathy, maybe 22, 23 miles um, in three hours. So we have that exact data, but it, it wasn't different between the two groups. I mean, what's with their, what was their performance in, let's say, a marathon time or a 5K time, not just in your three hour in lab test? So I'm hearing a lot of things about improved performance in eight, 10, 12 hour events, but when you start to get up to the higher end of VO2 max or even above VO2 max intensities, what kind of performances are you seeing as a difference between the two groups? Yeah, so these guys were all, like I said, triathlon and beyond. So we have all their, you know, without giving up names and violating confidentiality, I mean, we had some um, course record holders and national record holders that we were studying. So, you know, clearly the, the there, the, yes, actually, the, if anything, the high carb group had, we had a couple Olympic level athletes. Um, they were probably a, maybe a tad bit on the higher end performance, but we had some very elite low carb athletes too. So uh, clearly these guys are performing and nobody's holding a gun to their head, asking them to do this diet or telling them to do this diet. So they're doing it because of their own perceived benefit on performance since they're competing. Um, but none of these guys were competing in anything shorter than really a triathlon, so we don't have any, I don't have knowledge of that, but Peter's holding his hand up there. Yeah, I just want to comment, you know, your seeing just top showed a remarkable increase in fatty acid oxidation, mm -hmm. okay? So, yes, yeah, 2.3 times over the, the high carb group, but then just think about it, if you're looking at the higher intensity stuff, if you're doing 20% of that, 30%, that's that's a game changer. I, like I'm working with an Olympic gold medal swimmer right now in Australia, and she's fat up and yeah, we're giving her a lot of carbs, but it's the fat adaptation. So if you get 20% fat more fat adaptation, that's the game changer. And even guys like Renata Sonova are saying that that's one of the significance that a lot of people are missing that are kind of trying to question the validity for higher intensity exercise. But when I talk higher intensity, I'm not talking about hours, I'm talking about seconds. So when how you fast. get- so huh? How fast. Yeah, exactly. So when you start to get things that are glycogen or a lack or non-alactic glycogen dependent things, so a 10, sec 10 second to two minute energy system type of things, uh, what kind of data do you have? And this kind of might extend to uh, Dr. Wilson as well in terms of performance characteristics. That, I mean, that's all, that's all phosphagen and neural. Um, the, and, and, and 
of course, mechanical and, and so forth. So that, yeah, being fat adapted is not going to help you run a hundred meter sprint faster. I can, like after 10 seconds. So I understand the phosphogen system when you get into out of the phosphogen system, you get into anaerobic glycolytic pathways. So if you have a 45 second athlete, your speed skaters, your uh, track and field, 400 meter runners, there's swimmers, things, things that traditionally uh, you're outside of 100 percent VO2 max intensity, what are you seeing performance-wise? Yeah, well, I don't think there's much out there in the literature, um, and I'm not aware of too many testimonials or anecdotes, but the benefit's clearly not going to be during the, the event where it's not a metabolic, um, it's not based on fat metabolism, but, you know, I think you have to look a little beyond that, and even those athletes, if they can tolerate higher levels of training, may enhance their performance. If we can change their body composition, that may alter their performance. If they can recover faster, that may enhance their performance. So there could be a role of some type of fat adaptation in those athletes for different reasons. And so I think that has to be considered. And I'm not saying it would be an ideal diet for an elite level 400 meter sprinter, but there are other factors to consider other than just their, their fat ox oxidation during you know, during a 400 meter sprint, because that's probably not going to be relying on fat oxidation, even in the keto adapted state, it's going to be largely glycolytic, and you got to produce a lot of ATP per unit time to generate the, the power outputs. And then for, for the yeah, <clears throat> yeah, so um, the, the data that we do have is basically more of a repeated effort type of activity. So for example, we would do, um, sets of like 10 basically like you do like sets of 10 on the leg press equivalent or you use your 10 rm which is going to be past like the normal atp you know the just the phosphogen system but we had them repeat that for like every minute and obviously you're going to go to failure after your 10 rm so um we saw that when they did the once they keto adapted like their strength endurance went up so that's a repeated bout of like you know 20 30 seconds one thing we also see with repeated sprinting, like with hockey players, um, when we study them is, they become more and more reliant on aerobic systems, even if they're doing six second sprints. It's pretty cool. So, yeah, so I'm not sure about like the 400 meter. I think that uh, you bring it up, we have to do work on that, but at least with the repeated efforts, it could be beneficial, but um, you know, like I said, we obviously need a lot more. And then in your 2014 study, uh, I noticed that your protein synthesis rates increased uh, in both groups, but the uh, high carb group actually, protein synthesis stayed elevated for a longer period of time. So in both groups, we're seeing that the feather A is increased protein synthesis, but is it optimal in the lower carbohydrate group, seeing that you're seeing it extend for a longer period of time in the higher carbohydrate group? That's a great question. So I think. Okay, I think short-term protein synthesis is great. I think it's, I mean, it's awesome, right? But I think the ultimate measure of protein synthesis is long-term changes in muscle hypertrophy. So I, like, I think that's the gold standard and we see similar increases in that sense. What was the training age of uh, the people in your study? So the training age in our study was on average, how many years was it? You mean the age? Oh, so yeah. So they're about 22 years of age, but the training is probably like, it was definitely oh, over six years. Yeah. Well we had a lot of guys benching like 315. They weren't as elite as Jeff's endurance athletes, but we had a lot of guys who were like, you know, benching 315, you know, squatting, you know, you know, well over four plates to the floor. They were well trained. All of them had over three years of resistance experience, I think, on average is around. When you looked at the average increase in their bench press strength and their squat strength, the jumps that you saw indicated a much lower training age. That putting on 30, 40 pounds of strength to the lifts like that implies that you haven't been training that well. Yeah. Uh, is it the diet that drove the adaptations or maybe just training well for the first time? Yeah. I, and and I'm, this is just, I'm just saying, I could take Mo just with our training experience, I could probably take any, you could bring someone to squatting 405 and probably I could increase their squat by like 30 to 40 pounds relatively rapidly. Um, when, what I think, this is my thought, if you look at the literature on how people adapt, people, when people see people who are really strong, they think a linear response. 
But if you really look at the like very long term data, like from Hackenden's lab, he's in the longest term studies on elite weightlifters. It goes like this: they plateau for several several months, then in their periodized program they change it up so it's very something robust, and then they go like that, and then they plateau for several months or a year, and then they change it up drastically and they get a robust increase. I think our gains in hypertrophy and strength more come boom and then we plateau for a long time until we find something that can switch it up so when guys come in our lab we expose them to something that they're not used to being exposed to it's very novel it's extreme they're squatting uh, a lot more frequently and so we can put 30 40 pounds on their on their squat probably in eight weeks so then is it the novel stimulus or is it the nutrition well both groups gain the same amount Aside. So, uh, uh, you know, probably a combination. Do we see a difference with uh, elevated ketones in the neurological process of a muscle recruitment? So, and then also, too, in, a, in the ketogenic state, since it's anti-inflammatory, um, are we seeing a difference in muscle recruitment through the neurological pathways? <laughs> My colleague would love that question. <laughs> he thinks everything is motor unit recruitment. So uh, we don't know. That's a great question. Though. Great. Um, yeah. <laughs> 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 more, uh, I think you'd be more cognitive resilient, you know, uh, so you'd be protected against the hypoglycemia if you're exercising your blood glucose dips and you have ketones there that sort of spare your cognition and a lot of, you know, drive is kind of centrally mediated, of course, so you have that fuel flow. To, to CNS. Well, yeah, like, so if you have a relaxed brain, like the brain is not hyperactive, and yeah. you can focus more on the exercise itself, yes. then you're going to get a better performance from the athlete from that standpoint, too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Um, I thought I heard Dr. Volick mention uh, exogenous ketones and brown, and if those tissues was going to be addressed by someone. Did I just hear that? That's you comment. <laughs> no. That's him. Yeah, so we actually saw in our recent study uh, with Dr. Roberts, we supplemented with exogenous ketones and saw about a 41% increase in brown adipose tissue. Um, interestingly enough, the amount that we dosed was fairly low compared to like what's used with, with Dom and, and their lab. We used about 0.77 grams per kilo, which is really low compared to some of the stuff that they're doing with five to 10 grams per kilo. Because again, rats and, and animals have completely different metabolisms and they, they operate differently than, than us, so it was a low amount. We still saw a huge increase in BAT. When comparing energy substrates from a performance standpoint, have you guys also taken a look at whether a BAT maintenance and or a deficit, the effects on sex hormones, so testosterone, estrogen, progesterone? <coughs> So in our, in our long-term eight-week ketogenic diet, we did look at testosterone. Testosterone tend to go up. There's a significant increase in testosterone. One of the things, and you bring up a great point, that we've been playing around with a lot is people who are dieting, competing in shows, oftentimes their hormones are all over the place. So we've actually had a couple of people come into the lab and do shows, and then immediately post-show, we put them on a ketogenic diet to try and restore their hormones. Oftentimes those hormones are restored a lot faster. We've seen, uh, we've had at least five people come in and their hormones are restored a lot faster. Meanwhile, following like a bodybuilding competition, there's data to indicate your hormones can be messed up for six months to a year following that. So we can get them back a lot faster with that kind of approach. Yeah. I. I I think it's a great question. I've been interested in the diet testosterone interaction for almost 20 years and it's a, it's very complex too, but what what we see in the endurance athletes, these at least the ultra endurance athletes, the vast majority of them have very low testosterone, um uh, below levels that are diagnostic for hypogonadism. Um that's not to say they have signs and symptoms of of hypogonadism. So a lot of these guys probably just may have greater testosterone turnover. I mean, we don't really understand this. It's also very prevalent in the special ops community. A lot of these guys have low testosterone. A lot of guys are doing testosterone replacement therapy and, and potentially doing a lot of damage with that. 
so um, you know, the, ultimately testosterone doesn't do anything unless it's taken up into tissues, and and we've done some work with androgen receptors, and 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 so th you know that's another key component. Just because you have lower T doesn't mean it's not that it could mean more is taken up into the tissues and having an anabolic effect. Um, but we've been unable to show any effect of really the ketogenic diet um, to protect that um, or to raise testosterone, at least in our smaller studies. It's not harmful. I still sort of have the hypothesis that it could protect from lowering T from excessive exercise uh, because we do know that very low-fat diets cause T to go down. So it's, a, it's still a lot, of, a lot of unknowns there and need for more um, research. But there, I don't see any negative effect. And if anything, it should be positive because there is a relationship between higher fat and testosterone at more moderate levels of, of fat. So um, I think we have to stay tuned on that. I, I briefly heard Dominic talk about that on a podcast. And I've kind of been curious about that as far as if there's been like additional research in you, you pretty much nailed it in the sense it's like it doesn't matter if say the guy's testosterone is an index of 700 but he's only utilizing say a quarter of it compared to an index of 300 but his uptake is seven eighths of that it's like what conversion would be optimal yeah, yeah like androgen receptor density yeah. and sensitivity is not a big factor in that like Jeff said a lot of these elite guys and special forces they are they are hypogenical, you know, clinically, but they many of them just don't show signs of it. You know, and can grow muscle and grow muscle and perform at very elite levels. Free test or something. Yeah, that's that's it. Uh, yes. Great question. Have you looked into sex hormone binding? Uh, sex hormone uh, binding uh very well they now. Well, well, thank you. <laughs> I would think if there's a decrease in that, it may sort of help explain some of the... Yeah, I mean, we've looked at the whole angle to Jerry axis, and there, there's, it's not straightforward. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, branch chain amino acids, if I'm working out that day, I will take it usually midday. And I have checked my response probably hundreds of times from branch chain amino acids at different doses. And I find that, uh, yeah, about four grams total, which is about like 2.5 of, of leucine or whatever, doesn't really impact my, my own key pr tone production and has very little, if any, effect on. Actually, sometimes I get a, a mild hypoglycemic response, but mild, like a little bit. I don't get an increase in glucose. So I take it usually pre-workout or even intra-workout uh, to attenuate some of the, you know, protein loss that could accompany training. Uh, yes, uh, Pavel. Uh, I'd like to comment about, about the question about osteoporosis. Uh, so in the epilepsy world, there is in fact data uh, it pertains to children and it pertains to diets that are specifically 3 or 4 to 1 uh, ratio with uh, 20 grams of carbohydrate restriction a day. Uh, and if you do it long term, a year or two years longer, the rate of osteoporosis and osteopenia goes higher. Uh, and the uh, mechanisms are not known, but it's presumed to be uh, both combination of calcium. Uh, these kids are often calcium supplemented, so it's not the only explanation. Mild acidosis uh, is another possibility. Got time for one more question, Susan? Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I think that is a protein issue. So I wanted to mention that in my lab, I use males and female rodents. I'm not measuring sex hormones, but I do find some behavioral differences on a variety of tests. Um, I find different blood um, ketone and glucose levels in males and females if they're on the same diet. And on some of the stricter ketogenic diets, I found um, some of the shortening of that estrus cycle. So I know you're doing your kind of longevity and offspring model, and I would encourage you to include males and females in the triangle of those parameters as well. 
Yeah, we're, we're, we're doing that. And uh, the NIH, as you know, is requesting that we do females too. Uh, and I think it's extremely important you know, to do that because they may have, I, we think they have more variable responses and that's kind of why we are avoiding them, of course, because the estrous cycle. But I think that's almost more important to understand that and how if keto adaptation is different, if side effects are different, if the benefits, pros and cons are different to the ketogenic diet.